Okay. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Muhammad Abu Khair, CEO of MCO. Uh, Dr. Suhail Rakun caught up in the emergency room at Rashid Hospital. So uh, he will be joining us soon. But uh, we want to start on time. And I would like to welcome to our uh, seminar and webinar, Transforming MS from Paper to Practice, Dr. Suhail, uh, Dr. Tawfiq Saadi who is the Chief Medical Officer and Chair of Neurology at the American Center of Psychiatry and Neurology in Abu Dhabi. He's a well-known uh, in neurology in the Emirates, and specifically in Abu Dhabi, uh, was the Chairman of the Department at SKMC uh, for a long time. And here he will speak to us about when early is early. And we would like to start welcoming Dr. Tawfiq for his speech. So uh, let me start off by introducing a few concepts, which I'm sure most of the audience are quite familiar with. As you know that MS is a neurodegenerative disease characterized by recurrent relapses. Some of the relapses that patient would have may result in complete recovery. Others may result in incomplete recovery and others may result in some uh, residual deficit. But regardless of the number of relapses, the ultimate uh, feature of the disease, especially with several years since onset, will be accumulating disability. And that, again, is independent of the number of relapses. And that, again, shows the importance of early intervention before, patient, before our patients would reach that final stage of accumulating disability. The issue with this disorder that as, as I mentioned earlier, is characterized by recurrent relapses, that early on inflammation would be the hallmark of the disease. And as you can see in this slide, that can be manifested by acute inflammation causing some GAD enhancing lesion. If, you have, if, it hap, if you have, it happens that you would order MRI early in the course of the disease, but most of the activities that uh, you see with this disease will be in the subclinical levels. And in addition to that, and that more very importantly as well, that axonal loss tend to occur very early at the start of the disease and to continue to build up throughout the years of the course of the disease. And most importantly, that you will find, as you can see from this work by Dr. Trapp, that most of the axonal loss occurs within the first year after the onset of the disease. And that, again, that shows you the importance of early intervention, not only early, but probably aggressive intervention in order to prevent that significant axonal loss that will result over years of follow-up into diffuse atrophy. And as you can see from this slide on the right-hand side, that most of the axonal loss occur within the first five years. And the following years, the axonal loss tend to diminish, but it is an ongoing process. So you can easily distinguish two parts of the disease. The early part, which you can, is characterized by the peripheral uh, infiltration and inflammation, and and the later part was a CNS compartmentalization and degenerative process characterized mainly by axonal loss. But you need to keep in mind that the inflammatory process is an ongoing process even at the later stages of the disease. It is very true that it's maximal in the early stages of the disease, but that process is ongoing and it continues throughout the course of the disease, but obviously tend to diminish in the later the uh, stages of disease, as I mentioned earlier, with the CNS compartmentalization uh, component of the disease. The ultimate, uh, obviously, point of that disease, that would res result into diffuse atrophy. So it is an ongoing process characterized early on by acute inflammation with some axonal loss, but that continues throughout the course of the disease, resulting into uh, diffuse atrophy. So obviously, part of the problem with MS that significant proportion of the disease occur under the surface. And some of the patients may have some sub 
clinical symptoms before they even know they probably started to have MS symptoms. And because obviously with the axonal damage that can occur before having any clinical signs or symptoms of the disease, and the damage may be go unrecognized until probably it's too late to make any intervention that would restore the function of the damaged uh, component or the damaged organ. And indeed, if you look at this work in patients with CIS before they even diagnosed with MS, and as compared to healthy control, you can find that patients with CIS are more likely, as you can see here, about 57% of them to have some cognitive impairment as compared to the healthy controls. And most of the def deficit that you can encounter in patients when you do the psychometric testing would be the speed of information, processing, as well as attention. So that, again, to show you that even early on, before the MS was clinically diagnosed, there's an ongoing process that had resulted in some form of cognitive impairment before patients had even been formally diagnosed with MS. And as I mentioned earlier, it all has to depend on the functional capacity of the brain because the brain maybe early on will be able to compensate for some of the early axonal loss. However, when it reaches a threshold that the brain may not be able to compensate that at the stage when patients just start to have manifest some signs or clinical signs of worsening MS. And again, that could be probably too late to intervene at that stage because at the disease progress, the neurological reserve would be to become obviously depleted, which may result in reduced ability of the brain to compensate, obviously have difficulty recovering from relapses, worsening of symptoms and progression of disability. Giovanni had come up with a theory of a asymmetrical neurodegeneration process based on his theory of uh, that most of the involvement in the, in the in patient with MS are, uh, is length dependent. Whereas you can see, for instance, people, uh, for instance, the lower extremities are heavily involved because again, it's a length dependent process according to his theory, though it is a random process. And because of that theory, that call to intervene at a stage before some of the organs that can be involved in that process would have uh, uh, irreversible damage where intervention may not be at that stage quite adequate to restore that uh, impaired function of that uh, uh, organ. So you can distinguish two parts of the disease, early part and later stage of the disease. And the main question that we face, would starting treatment early at the time of the diagnosis would prevent patients from reaching the progressive stage of the disease, or should we wait until we see clinical signs of progression at that stage would switch them to a higher efficacy treatment may will uh, take us to the same uh, route with uh, the ultimate goal of preventing the worsening progression of the disease. Obviously, from looking at this cartoon, it clearly shows you that if you start early at the early stages of the disease, that would basically result in a better outcome as compared to patients who would start at a later stage of the disease, which may result obviously in some uh, progression and probably it would be too late to intervene. The question, do we have data to support that theory? Well, if you look at this work uh, uh, at patients with, uh, that with newly diagnosed MS consists of 639 patients, these patients were started at different uh, strength of immunomodulating treatment. Some of them had started on interferons. Some of them had started on fingolimod. Some of them had started on rituximab. And if you look at the risk of reaching irreversible ADS score of four had definitely increased by 7.4% for each year of treatment delay. So patients who started on treatment, again, regardless of the treatment, being interferon, fingolimod, or rituximab, uh, less than one year are less likely to reach that stage of ADS score of four as compared to patients who started on treatment between year and one and three as compared to patients who, for instance, started on treatment after three years. So clearly starting on treatment early had resulted in delaying the progression of uh, phase of the disease. 
Another work based on the Danish registry, looking at the same thing. They looked at patients who started on treatment less than two years as compared to patients who started on treatment between year two and eight after obviously clinical onset. Same as we have seen with the previous study, patients were started on different immunomodulating agents. Some of them were in platform therapies, others were on escalating therapies with fingolomod or uh, almitizumumab uh, or rituximab. And the risk of e reaching the ASA score of six was similar to what we have seen with the previous study, was increased by 42% in the group of late starter as compared to patients who started on treatment early, meaning less than two years after clinical onset. Well, we have demonstrated so far that starting early treatment, being on interferon, being on platform therapy or on uh, medium strength immunomodulating agents or on uh, higher strength immunomodulating agents would definitely delay the progression of the disease. But the big question that we may have in mind, would it make a difference if you start your patients on a platform therapy as compared to your bigger gun with a, a high efficacy immunomodulating agent. Would that make a difference? Well, some of the studies would address that point. This is the data looking at uh, plotting all the studies that we have so far on patients with CIS and the likelihood of these patients converting to clinical definite MS. And as you can see from this example that patients who started on cladribine, for instance, are less likely to convert to clinically definite MS as compared to other platform therapies. Obviously, with all the drawbacks we're doing these uh, uh, meta-analysis because as you know, the differences in the, the design of the trials, the inclusion criteria, et cetera, but it does at least give you a signal that starting on clozapine, for instance, would less reduce that risk of patients converting to clinically definite MS as compared to patients on other platform therapies. Again, going back to the Danish registry, where in, they did in this study, they matched 220 patients started on uh, uh, some of the, uh, we call it medium strength uh, uh, or platform therapy, let it be interferon, glatrimal acetates, or terafenamide, or DMF, as compared to patients who started on fingolomod, natilizumab, or rituximab, or oftab. And if you can see here that the likelihood of patients reaching the ATS score worsening was much less in the patients who started on the high efficacy immunomodulating agents one of these drugs that I mentioned earlier, as compared to patients who started on one of the medium efficacy immunomodulating agents. Obviously, some of them were platform therapies. In addition, the probability of patients having a first on relapse was much less in patients with the highly efficacy therapy as compared to patients with the medium efficacy therapy. Another study looking at, uh, looking at MS space where they again compared high efficacy therapy, fingolomod, natilizumab, as compared to the platform therapy, interferon and glatimal acetate. And the look of the cumulative risk of conversion to secondary progressive MS following their first treatment with one of these two lines of treatment. Again, the study came in favor of the high efficacy therapy where the less likely patient would go on to the secondary progressive phase of the disease as compared to patients who uh, started on one of the platform therapies. Similarly, the data on elmetizumab had confirmed the same thing. The likelihood of disease progression or disability progression had come much later if patients started on this treatment as compared to the interferon therapies. Uh, another study based on real world evidence looking at patients who started early on with a high efficacy, efficacy therapy as compared to patients who were switcher, meaning they would start on the high efficacy therapy after they fail and then they were escalated to the high efficacy therapy. And the, uh, the secondary outcome on the, of that study was sustained disability. And as you can see very clearly in the slide, that likely of patients reaching that stage of sustained disability was much uh, uh, earlier in the switcher or in patients who follow the escalation approach as compared to patients with the early intensive treatment, meaning that patients who started on early intensive treatment were less likely to reach that stage of sustained disability as compared to patients who started on that treatment, but later on in the course of the disease. This is the data on uh, oclizumab, and we will get to that later on. 
as you know, early on, uh, with the study of eclizumab, which we'll get in more detail later on, where patients were randomized to either uh, eclizumab versus interferon, and then they went into the extension phase of the disease. For patients who continued on the drug early on, and they continued on the drug throughout the long phase, uh, long-term phase of the disease, the likelihood of them going into the progressive phase of the disease were much less as compared to patients who were initially on interferon, and then they were switched back to eclizumab after they entered the extension phase of the disease, meaning those patients were less likely to catch up as compared to the patients who early on started and continued on eclizumab from the uh, start from the onset. Now, obviously, our understanding of MS had evolved throughout the years. And now, especially after the recent McDonald criteria, we became more equipped to make an early and accurate diagnosis of MS as compared to the old days. So now we can make an early diagnosis of MS based on the modified criteria, which I'm not gonna go in detail uh, with. And because of that, the ECTRIMS and the AN had come up with a very strong statement advocating early treatment, whether in patient with confirmed uh, MS, early MS, or when patient in the CIS stage, in both of these examples, they call for an early and uh, 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 early on treatment with patients with either CIS or early signs of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Same thing, uh, the MS uh, Brain Health had come up with a very strong statement advocating early and aggressive treatment for patient with MS because time is your brain. And this is a very important concept that you need to bear in mind when you deal, patients, we deal with patients with MS, time is brain. It's very important to intervene early on at the time where brain is capable of restoring its capacity as compared to the later stage of the disease where the brain is probably depleted and may not be able to compensate it, to compensate for some of the lost functions. And obviously, as you can see from the slide, there are many reasons people may not be able to get to early treatment, being lack of access, difficulty in making the diagnosis, is, is it related to the cultural or educational issues? But all of these issues had to be addressed at multiple levels in order for allowing our patients to have the access to an early as well as right treatment in order to prevent the accumulated disability of the disease. In addition to that, you need to keep in mind whether we are dealing with patients with a relapsing remitting form of the disease or we're dealing with patients with a primary progressive disease. And this is the two studies, the pooled data from the OPERA trial, as well as the data from uh, Ortario trial, which we'll get to uh, later on in patients with primary progressive disease, starting on the treatment early on would definitely reduce risk of progression in both of these uh, forms of the disease, being in the relapsing remitting form of the disease or in the progressive form of the disease, both of them can have an effect on uh, preventing the progressive phase or reaching the progressive phase of the disease. Obviously, our treatment goals had somewhat evolved over the years. Our uh, obviously current treatment is to reduce disease activity by improving symptoms of relapses, reducing disease activity, as well as reducing the accumulation of disability. But more importantly, probably, is looking at the emerging uh, treatment options, which is to prevent the development of relapses, reduction disease activity, and hoping to stop the, that disease progression. And obviously our aim for NIDA, which is no evidence of disease activity, and more recently we start to apply a concept of no evidence of progression or, or active disease or NEPAD. B cells, as you know, are quite important in the pathogenesis of MS. Uh, you, as compared to the control, for instance, we know that B cells are quite prominent in the meninges, as well as in the MS active lesions, regardless of lesion being active or in the slowly expanding lesions, but definitely B cells are quite important in the pathogenesis of MS disease. Now, quickly, I'm just going to summarize to you the data specifically on the long-term extension data on OPERA1 and OPERA2, because this is an important uh, studies to look at. As you know, the OPERA1 and 2 looked at patients with, who are randomized to either nitrofenone or eclizumab, and then after a screening phase of four weeks, they went into the extension phase up to six years. And as you can see here, that patients who started on eclizumab early on, they continued on that throughout the years of follow-up. They, uh, their uh, obviously risk of having further relapses is much less throughout the years 
are follow up as compared to patients who start on interferon and then they're switched later on to, uh, to oclizumab. Obviously, this patient, when they made the switch, there was still a significant reduction in the uh, annualized relapsing rate, but not to the same extent as we have seen in patients who started on oclizumab and they continued throughout the years of uh, follow up. And this is uh, looking at the study looking at the 24 week confirmed EDSS disability progression. As I mentioned earlier, that patients who started on oclizumab and they continued throughout the years of follow up in the extension phase are less likely to reach that 24 week uh, disability progression as compared to patients who started on interferon and then they were switched to oclizumab and they continued on the long term extension phase of the disease. Similarly, if you look at the, uh, the, the cohort of patients who, whom we're looking at the, the, the change in ADS score from baseline uh, up to two, four years of follow-up in both of these trials, again, patients who started on the drug early on, eclizumab early on, as compared to the switcher, they're less likely to reach that ADS progression as compared to patients who were a switcher uh, from interferon to eclizumab at the later stage. Similarly, uh, now what, what they try to do in the follow-up study, they try to look at 48-week confirmed ADSS disability progression because obviously if you look at the 12, 24 weeks may not be adequate to assess the long-term effect of this medication over long-term or follow-up. So they wanna assess longer term of follow-up on this patient to make sure that th this drug continue beyond that traditional 12, 24 week assessment uh, and uh, that had been observed in that study looking at 48 week confirmed EDSS disability progression. Similar to what we have seen with the 24 week confirmed EDSS uh, disease progression. Same thing, exact same thing. Patients who start oclizumab early on, they, can, they, they have a less risk of going into the uh, 48, 48 weeks confirmed disability as compared to the switchers, meaning they started on interferon and then they were switched to oclizumab less risk, obviously, of reaching that stage on the ongoing treatment with oclizumab as compared to the switcher of, to this medication. Uh, also, in addition to that, if you look uh, to uh, looking at the clinical disease improvement, similarly, patients who started oclizumab and continued on that for long-term follow-up of the disease, more likely to reach that stage uh, of clinical disease improvement as compared to the uh, switcher from interferon to the oclizumab. Uh, that would reflect as well in terms of improvement in the total brain volume, where patients who start oclizumab continue throughout the years of the, the follow-up, more likely to preserve their, their brain as compared to patients who start on interferon then then were switched later on to oclizumab. So obviously, in both on the double-blinded phase of the trial, as well as in the long-term data, we have seen, for instance, in the double blind phase of the trial that the drug had significantly reduced the relapsing rate as compared to placebo arm, obviously. The oclizumab had significantly reduced the, the ADSS progression. In addition, it definitely reduces the burden of the lesions and increases the chance of patient reaching the NIDA stage as compared to the interferon arm. When we look at the extension phase of the trials, clearly that the initial uh, uh, reduction in the annualized relapsing rate that we have seen with the oclizumab had been maintained in patients who continue on the drug. For the switcher from interferon to oclizumab, they obviously have noticed some subsequent and some robust reduction in annualized relapsing rate, but they did not yet had reached uh, or catch up with the reduction that we have seen with the oclizumab arm. Patient, however, who started on eclizumab as compared to the patients who, who were a switcher from interferon had a significantly greater disability benefit as compared to the switchers. And obviously the earlier treatment with eclizumab had lower the brain tissue loss with time as compared to patients who were on interferon and then they were switched to eclizumab. And uh, we have also demonstrated that the early NIDA can be easily reach with oclizumab treatment as compared and maintained as well as compared to patients who were on the, the interferon and then they were switched to oclizumab at a later stage when the patient entered the long-term of phase of disease. Now, what about patients with primary progressive disease? And that will be 
looking at the long-term extension data with uh, Ortario study. Uh, as you know, that patients after the randomization, they go on to the extension phase of the disease. And similar what we have seen with the initial uh, trials with the OPERA 1 and 2, same exact findings, basically. The time of onset to disease progression, uh, 48 weeks after the randomized uh, phase of the trial was much in favor of patients who started oclizumab as compared to patients who were on placebo. And then they were switched to oclizumab when the patient had entered the, uh, the, uh, the long-term extension phase of the trial. Looking again at the 24-week confirmed ADSS disability, same exact finding as we have seen with the patients with the relapsing remitting phase of the disease with the OPERA 1 and 2, patients on oclizumab and maintained on oclizumab throughout the years of follow-up were less likely to reach that 24 week of confirmed disability as compared to patients who were on interferon and then who were, I'm sorry, were on placebo and then they were switched to the uh, oclizumab uh, arm at the long-term extension phase. Even looking at the time to onset of EDSS7, much in favor of the oclizumab arm as compared to the placebo arm, and then they're switched later on to the uh, oclizumab arm. So all in all, clearly we have shown that oclizumab, early treatment of oclizumab has resulted in significant reservation of the brain volume, and that can be seen in this trial, that the brain volume loss is less likely in patients who, can, who start on the treatment and continued throughout the years of follow-up as compared to patients who started on placebo and then they will switch at a later stage to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the active medication. Similarly, the burden of TTU lesions are much less in patients who started on the drug early on and maintained as compared to placebo arm treatment and converted later on to the, uh, to the drug as well. Similarly, what we have seen with the OPERA 1 and 2 trial, we have seen benefit of this medication in both in the double-blinded phase of the trial as well as in the extension phase of the trial, where in the double-blinded phase of the trial, the drug had significantly slowed the ADSS progression. It definitely preserved the upper lipid function as compared to the placebo arm, and it definitely had reduced the burden of the lesions as well as the brain volume loss as compared to the placebo arm. Similarly, when we look at the extension phase data, the earlier treatment with the drug had provided long-term disability benefit as compared to the, the delayed treatment. The earlier treatment with the drug had delayed treat time to fundamental clinical milestones, such as loss of uh, upper motor function and obviously time to wheelchair bound as compared to the placebo arm and then they switched later to the medication. And the earlier drug would, uh, had provided long-term reduction in the brain volume uh, as well as the, the total uh, uh, T2 burden as compared to patients who start on the treatment, but at a later stage of the, the treatment process. So I just want to sum it up that in patients with relapsing remitting MS disease, patients who started on oclizumab as compared to the patients who started on interferon had reduced relapse rate and reduced level of disability, which can be maintained and can be observed throughout the years of follow-up. The patients who were switched from interferon then to oclizumab, there was significant reduction in the annualized relapsing rate. In patients who had a diagnosis of primary progressive MS, uh, patients who started on oclizumab as compared to the placebo uh, arm had lower rates of clinical disease progression, which had been maintained throughout the years of follow-up. And the earlier treatment with the oclizumab had provided long-term disability benefit as compared to patients who start on the medication, but at a later stage of the disease. And all these trials, OPERA-1, OPERA-2, as well as the extension phase of the Ortario, all had provided us with a very important information that will guide us into uh, treatment with this medication and would be a big advocate of the early and aggressive treatment with a highly effective medication such as eclizumab. Uh, and obviously that had been supported with several real world evidence data that would support the earlier use of the right treatment for patient in order to prevent the uh, progressive, reaching the progressive uh, phase of the disease. With that, I would end and thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to speak at this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Tufriq, for excellent presentation on uh, oclizumab and on the disease modifying therapy versus the platform therapies and showing the efficacy in early treatment for both uh, relapse uh, 
MS versus uh, and primary progressive MS. So we'll open it now for a question and answer. And one of the question uh, from Dr. Rabha saying, what is the safety of oclizumab during the pandemic of COVID-19? I think this will be addressed uh, in the the other the two case presentation that will present by Dr. Caesar. So we can defer that discussion at that stage because that will be addressed in his uh, case discussions. Okay. Second question, Dr. Nawal saying, how much time does it generally take to have accumulating big disability in case of MS? It really varies from patient to patient and it depends on the underlying pathophysiology. And some patients may take several years, 10 years plus, and others may take even less than this. So it really de is dependent, it's patient dependent uh, based, based on the underlying pathophysiology of the disease. Uh, regardless, it's a call to have an early intervention before we reach that stage. And some, obviously in some patients whom we see an early sign that suggests we are dealing with an aggressive form of the disease, for those patients, uh, specifically, we probably have to be more careful and we should be more advocate and a stronger advocate for an early as well as an aggressive treatment before patients reaches the irreversible stage of the disease. Okay. We have one of the attendees. She said, I'm a dentist, MS patient diagnosed in 2002, started beta in 2006, escalating treatment to Mabinaclad next uh, the following week. And she said, is your advice to start aggressive treatment from the start, irrespective of whether it is a minor form of MS or not? Well, again, this is what we're trying to say. I mean, every patient is different. I mean, I don't know about this particular case. Uh, I, I personally am in favor to uh, treat patients early on. Uh, if you, uh, regardless if you're going to go with the platform therapy or with the or with the medium or high strength uh, immunomodulating agent, I believe that uh, I strongly believe in the stratified management of patients with MS. Meaning that for patients whom I believe there are signs suggest that more likely we are dealing with a mild form of MS, I'm I'm more inclined to treat them with the platform therapies as compared to patients, for instance, where I see some scientists suggest that probably we are dealing with uh, some form of uh, aggressive form of disease or more likely patient would progress over time. For those patients, again, I'm more in favor of hit them with the big gun right from the beginning. Okay. Because I still believe actually there is a there are some forms of MS that can be quite mild and they can be benign. I mean, I mean obviously the jury is out and some may, may disagree with, with me about that concept, but I believe the concept of benign MS do exist and there are some uh, subpopulation of patients with MS that they do have the mild form of MS. For those, I probably would be more cautious before I would consider hitting them with the uh, medium or high, high strength immunomodulating agents. Okay. A question from Noor Ali. She's saying, how to manage depression when on ocromazumab? Well, depression, as you know, is quite common in patients with MS. And the literature is full of studies that have clearly shown that patients with MS are more likely to have comorbid depression as compared to general population. So obviously, if your patient had comorbid depression, it's not because of the drug. It's just because of the MS itself. Oclizumab would not cause depression, but patients with MS in general are most likely to be have comorbid depression. And again, it de the treatment would be dependent on the, the severity of depression mm -hmm. and how familiar and, and and how familiar you are with the various treatment modalities in patients with with, uh, with uh, depression. If you are quite familiar with the management of depression, then I would start them with one of the SSRIs. They're quite effective, easy to manage uh, in patients with uh, comorbid depression. Uh, SNRIs as well can be also effective. In addition to that, they will confer the, the, the advantage of having their, uh, their protective uh, uh, properties in terms of managing neuropathic pain, which as you know, is quite common in patients with MS. But uh, Basically, I would start them with simply with SSRIs first. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gubernat, is, is she saying one of my patients is not willing to have any sort of disease modifying therapy. Uh, she prefer to be on steroid. How to explain the safety concern to the patient? 
Well, it's not the safety concern. Obviously, it's going to be the issue of the disease progression. And you probably have to share with her some of the data on the, the uh, natural course of the disease in patients who are uh, undertreated or untreated. Because as you know that the ultimately the patient may reach the stage of irreversible damage if they are undertreated or they are untreated as compared to patients who are treated early on. So I would, I would suggest it depends obviously on the level of education of that patient. I would share with her some of the data either the natural course of the disease in patients who were not treated at all or in patients who were un undertreated. And by the way, this is not the first time I've heard that patients refusing treatment and they elect to go on whether monthly or quarter, quarterly, for instance, treatment with IV methylprednisone. I've seen it and I know some people are doing it, but it's our obligation as a healthcare provider to advocate our patients about this uh, wrong practice and to uh, suggest to them to go on to right treatment in order to prevent that uh, reaching the stage of unfortunate disability. Okay. Uh, last question before we move to uh, Dr. Caesar is, is there any guidelines when to start high efficacy, efficacy drugs? Or the disease well, like drugs? Uh, there are several guidelines that had been put together by uh, the Menactrims, as well as the, they are, uh, which had been recently updated. And I'll be happy to share with the group uh, the, our, the recent guidelines that would basically s summarizing uh, in a stratified manner which drug you would choose based on the level of the disease stage platform therapy as versus complete to as compared to escalation therapy or to start some of these patients early on with a high efficacy treatment and that has been well outlined and well addressed in the recent uh, menactrims guidelines okay so we can dr tofid can share this guidelines with the group Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tawfiq, for a very informative session. And we will move now to Dr. Caesar Zaka, who is a consultant neurologist at Zahra Hospital in Dubai. He is an American board certified uh, neurologist and has been practicing neurology for the past 20 years. And he will present two cases of Ocrevus from paper to practice. So, Dr. Caesar, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so I don't have maybe as high voice as, as Dr. Taufi. I hope you can bear with me. So basically, I'll start with case one. Uh, this is a naive patient, uh, 35 years old, Sudanese gentleman. He came first time on the 25th of August, 2020 because of numbness was felt on the right side of the face and the whole tongue for the last uh, 10 days. It was uh, coming on and off with minor paresthesia in the fingertips and toe tips, uh, which started uh, after that. Test was okay, no other complaints, no significant past medical history, has a history of uh, hemorrhoidectomy. He smokes five cigarettes per day, non-drinker, no other illicit drugs. So the symptoms were quite mild and uh, 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 not typical of the usual uh, MS attacks we see. However, the physical exam showed lungs, heart exam was normal, no carotid bruise. Lermit sign uh, was slightly positive, mental status normal, and he showed an obvious vertical nystagmus, a skew deviation in addition to right gaze horizontal nystagmus, no afferent pupillary defect or internuclear ophthalmoplegia. There was a decrease in touch and pinprick on the right side of the face, and there was no tongue deviation. There was, in addition, a mild right drift. Otherwise, no major uh, motor or sensory deficits were seen in the extremities. There were no cerebellar signs, no pyramidal signs. Romberg was negative. Gait and coordination were normal as well, and deep tendon reflexes were normal and symmetrical. I ordered an MRI on this gentleman, and uh, the MRI showed I was actually amazed to see the number of lesions he has. So he had infratentorial lesion seen in the pons, 
in the medulla. Uh, there were tumefactive lesions seen in the right temporal lobe and in other areas as well, multiple lesions, some of them taking a uh, cystic pattern. There were multiple uh, colossal lesions, juxtacortical and periventricular lesions. This is the same uh, pontine lesion we saw earlier. MRI with contrast uh, showed some uh, burr holes on the T1 in addition to partially enhancing lesions, as we can see. Some of the lesions were partially enhancing and some of them were not. So this patient met the criteria for dissemination in time and space. Uh, again, the same lesions we can see. Now, because of the uh, somewhat atypical presentation and because of the multiple cranial nerve deficits, we saw, uh, in addition to multiple sclerosis, I was suspecting neurosarcoidosis as a, another uh, less likely diagnosis. Chest X-ray was done, was normal. VEP was normal. Blood test, including thyroid function test, NMO antibodies, ESR, S levels were all normal. CSF showed 20 WBC, 80% of them were lymphocytes, two unmatched oligoclonal bands and, uh, bands and increased IgG. The patient received three days of solumedrol, one gram daily. The numbness in the tongue and face were better, but he was experiencing some fatigue since the beginning of the symptoms more than his usual. Disease-modifying treatments were discussed thoroughly with all the pros and cons with him and his fiancée, who seemed to be even more interested in reading about all the different disease-modifying treatments and uh, sort of having the conversation about that. So in this gentleman, there were multiple concerns. First of all, that there was an aggressive nature of the lesions radiologically even though uh, clinically it was a mild presentation. Uh, there were other risk factors, uh, being male, age 37, enhancing lesions, infratentorial lesions. Uh, some studies may, may uh, speak about also the African, because usually we are sort of pre, uh, 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 in the beginning, uh, when we spoke about MS first, uh, always the Caucasian were apparently more predisposed. So with African being uh, uh, having the disease and with this amount of lesions that can also have a higher risk. So escalation treatment seemed to be uh, quite necessary uh, to use rather than going with the platform therapies. Uh, between the escalation treatment themselves, Ocrevus seemed to be a good option especially during the COVID-19 situation, and in addition, the mild clinical scenario relatively. Because as we know, we have also between the uh, escalation treatment, the Lemtrada, the Cladribine, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, sometimes with this milder sort of a clinical presentation uh, with, and with the discussion with the patient, we felt that we may go with Ocrevus rather than with Lemtrada and especially with the COVID-19 situation in the beginning, there was some concern, especially about the Lemtrada and also about cladrimine earlier on. So he received the first dose of Ocrevus in the beginning of October. Second dose was in the mid-October. As a follow-up, the sensory symptoms have decreased markedly. He still feels more fatigue than usual in addition uh, to some insomnia. He was placed on amantadine, 100 milligram daily, in addition to increased uh, caffeine intake, and is also on vitamin D and PRN mydocalm for muscle pain, which he experienced sometimes. Now we move to a case which is totally different from the first one, which is a switch on uh, uh, treatment uh, from another to Ocrevus. So this is a 51 years old Jordanian American woman. She had her first attack seven years ago with paraparesis and gait deficits 
involving uh, the lower extremities and more the left lower extremity. She had another attack causing increased weakness in the lower extremities and mild left upper extremity weakness in the same year. She had a positive MRI and CSF spine. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, she had positive MRI uh, of the brain and spine in addition to positive CSF and was diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS. She was started at that time on Copaxone about six years ago and was continued for two years. Later on, it was a start because of injection site reactions, pain and swelling, in addition to feeling weaker for about 24 hours after the injection. However, her gait had improved after the treatment and she did not uh, experience further attacks. So at that time, because of the injection uh, site reactions and because of the other symptoms she was experiencing, she decided to stop treatment for a couple of years uh, till she got another attack two years later, causing her more weakness in the lower extremities and also mild uh, weakness in the left upper extremity. So there seemed to be, in her case, some reactivation of maybe the same lesions. As, as was mentioned yesterday in, uh, in another MS lecture. At that time, she received autologous stem cells from her fat cells in San Diego in 2018. Uh, she was using a cane at that time to go outside, but she can walk without a cane uh, inside the house. Uh, she was uh, put on Vampira 10 milligram twice a day and prednisolone 20 milligram uh, every day uh, when she came to see me in February 2020. She came to the ER on the 13th of February 2020 because of one month feeling increase in weakness in the left side with severe pain on the same side. She ranked it in a laughing way as 15 over 10. But she seemed to be quite uh, in a pain. She received 500 milligrams solumedrol in the ER uh, after which uh, uh, she, uh, she felt somewhat better. She came to the outpatient clinic next day on the 14th. No other past, past medical history, no surgical history, and family history was unremarkable. Uh, she had normal general physical exam. Mental status was normal. Pupils were equally reactive. There was no partial uh, afferent pupillary defect, no internuclear ophthalmoplegia. There was a uh, horizontal nystagmus and upgaze vertical nystagmus. Uh, fundoscopic exam was normal. Other cranial nerve exam was normal. Bilateral drift is seen with the left uh, more pronounced. Strength was five minus out of five in the right upper extremity four out of five in the left upper and in the right lower, and two to three out of five in the left lower extremities. She came in a wheelchair, uh, is able to use a cane, but with major difficulty, may be able to walk only less than 20 steps with a cane. There was increased tone in the left lower extremity, a decreased proprioception and vibration in the lower extremities and more so in the left, Lermit was negative, Babinski sign was positive in the left, deep tender reflexes, three out of five. She had a spastic gait on the left side, no cerebellar signs. EDSS was quite high, six to 6.5 at that time. She brought her MRI, which was done one year ago, and it showed uh, multiple supratentorial periventricular plus juxtacortical lesions in addition to one infratentorial lesions and two cervical spinal lesions. She received one gram of solumedrol for three days, followed by tapered dose, uh, tapered oral dose. Osteocare, vitamin D, omeprazole uh, were given. Routine labs were done. MRI was ordered without and with contrast. She improved markedly on the solumedrol from EDSS 6.5 to 5. Uh, options were discussed about the different uh, disease-modifying treatment, and with her degree of disability and having tried first-line treatment or platform treatment, it was felt that escalation is definitely recommended, keeping in mind that she may be having secondary progressive course. However, 
she was uh, voluntarily locked down due to COVID-19, and she was quite determined about not to uh, do any further investigation and to have the treatment at this uh, time because of fear uh, of the COVID-19, especially in the early outbreak. Uh, she did the MRI in June 2020, and she was followed in July. Her MRI showed extremely heavy load, and there was actually increase in the number of lesions in the brain and cervical spine. She did not have, however, a clinical attack during the past four months. However, her EDSS again increased and became worse in the range of 5.5. It seems that there was some progressive component. And this is her MRI, which shows uh, juxta ventricular lesions and periventricular lesions. Again, multiple subcortical lesions. Uh, we can see also uh, infratentorial lesions, especially in the cerebellar peduncles and cerebellar hemispheres. Colossal lesions, uh, subcortical juxtacortical lesions. And we can see about three to four lesions in the cervical and upper thoracic spine. So the patient seemed to have an active secondary progressive MS. Uh, why we are saying that? Because uh, she definitely had attacks uh, previously. However, uh, the last attack that she came in in February 2020 seemed to be of insidious uh, uh, progression. In addition, that after she got the solumedrol in the last uh, four months, also she seemed to progress in her EDSS, even though she didn't have a typical uh, attack. So, so frankly, it, it was felt that at that time we can uh, categorize her as uh, secondary progressive MS and especially active secondary progressive MS. Uh, different uh, uh, disease modifying treatments were discussed. She was given time to read also about the different medications. Uh, she felt uh, more after also uh, having this uh, long discussion with her, she felt more towards the Ocrevus. Ocrevus, uh, as we know, has been approved by the US FDA for the treatment of primary progressive MS, as Dr. Tawfiq uh, mentioned now also, and uh, as well as relapsing forms of uh, multiple sclerosis, which include clinically isolated, relapsing remitting, and active secondary progressive MS. Ocrevus continues to be the most prescribed uh, modifying uh, inflammatory, uh, modifying treatment in inflammatory disease with active secondary progression among U.S. neurologists, even though Mazent and Mavenclad were approved. As per uh, some studies that were done in the U.S., uh, going over uh, what is uh, most uh, used by uh, different neurologists uh, in the U.S., and it was felt that Ogrevet still is more used than Mazent and maybe Glad for this indication. Uh, so Ocrevus was given in the beginning of October and mid-October. On follow-up in mid-November, she was feeling well, no complaints. Her EDSS has improved to five again. A blood count was within normal limits. I'm just mentioning the last slide. Uh, about the autologous hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplants. Uh, uh, there is a current consensus supporting the use if we are dealing with relapsing remitting MS patients who are younger than 45 years old, able to ambulate independently, have illness duration of less than 10 years, and at least have two clinical relapses in the previous year despite the use of other disease-modifying treatments with MRI evidence of concurrent disease activity. For if, if the patient uh, has a, a higher degree of disability or occasionally has a progressive course, it could be considered, but we have uh, to keep in mind that it should, in this case, uh, we should make sure 
uh, that there is more MRI activity and that we are, we are using it in uh, uh, a big center, specialized center uh, with interest in uh, hematopoietic uh, stem cell uh, transplants. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caesar, for your presentation on the two cases. And uh, uh, one of the questions saying that there are now many different disease modifying therapy in the market, uh, oral and injectable. Uh, how do you make your decision uh, of what to start the patient on? Uh, very nice question. Definitely, we face this question on daily basis. Uh, it's not always easy to decide. We have to take different uh, 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 points. I mean, first of all, definitely, if, uh, again, like what Dr. Taufik mentioned before, before if uh, we are dealing with very mild uh, kind of MS, maybe we should go with the platform treatment. And that, and we take into consideration uh, the situation of the patient. If the patient, uh, again, is a female, is expecting to get pregnant soon, so that all that can affect our decision which uh, disease-modifying treatment we should use. Now, uh, for the if we are dealing with more aggressive uh, disease, uh, such as as I mentioned, the first patient, for example. We are dealing here with a patient who had multiple lesions, especially in the spinal cord. This is one of also the criteria for having a, uh, a sort of high risk patient. Uh, in addition that he had multiple lesions. Uh, this is his first presentation and on physical examination, he had multiple, uh, even though minor, but multiple deficits. Uh, so here we need to go into uh, an escalation treatment. Now, between the escalation treatments, we, we need to uh, take into consideration definitely the other uh, maybe uh, comorbid, if there, are, if there are comorbidities going on. Uh, first of all, sometimes the patient preference, we need to know about the job of the patient, how easy for this patient to take this treatment, because as we know, now we have injectable uh, medication that uh, if the patient is traveling too much, we need to take that into consideration. Some patients also with their type of uh, uh, life they are leading, they may not prefer to take uh, medications on daily basis. So they may prefer to take the medications that can be taken twice a year or once a year, etc. So that's also another consideration. So I can say, depending on the severity of disease, uh, depending on the comorbidities and depending on the patient preference, we can go with uh, different disease modifying treatments. Okay. Uh, Clozumab uh, shown to slow the progression of the disease of MS. Can it stop relapses? Can it stop relapses? I mean, it's definitely indicated, indicated for relapsing remitting MS and, uh, and by the studies, definitely it showed uh, a major decrease in the number of attacks and uh, uh, I cannot say that definitely for all patients, it will stop all the attacks, but at least it will decrease the attacks in most of the patients. Yes. So, uh, you know, MS drug are either moderately effective or more effective or highly effective if they reduce relapses by two thirds versus one third versus half of the, so you would say that it is highly effective? Exactly, yes it's considered between one of the highly effective treatments in comparison definitely to the platform therapies. Okay. Now, a question here, this, this patient received the stem cell therapy. Mm. Would you say stem cell therapy now, is it in the guideline? Does it, uh, is it advocated? And if it is, at what stage? And were the patient disappointed that she still had relapse even though she had stem cell therapy? Okay, now, now frankly, if the patient is in a very specialized center 
and meeting the criteria I mentioned before, we can go with that. But again, we need to keep in mind that if the patient is failing the other disease modifying treatments, frankly, if I was her physician in back in US, I may not go to stem cell as a second choice. Definitely, I don't, I don't agree with going into the stem cell as a second choice. I don't know the details. I think the patient at that time was refusing the other disease modifying treatment and the physician had discussion with her. This is at least what I remember what she told me. She was not into much after her experience with the Copac zone. She was not much into other disease modifying treatment. So after maybe long discussion and being in a highly specialized center and maybe being in a uh, trial again, she decided to go into the stem cell therapy. Okay. Uh, one attendee is asking, why did you choose acrylovis in each case, the naive and early switch? Okay. Now, for the naive patient, again, I choose the acrylovis, uh, first of all, because it seemed to be an aggressive nature of the disease, at least radiologically again. And uh, this is uh, again, the first attack with having all these lesions seemed to be an aggressive disease. So I had to start with a, uh, I had to start with an escalation treatment, not definitely not with uh, a platform. Uh, but again, because there was in the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, maybe uh, many of us know that, that in the beginning there was concern about all the DMTs. Later on, many DMTs uh, were seen as safe and few uh, such as cladribine and lemtrada were felt to be uh, a little bit uh, uh, that sh they should be delayed. And later on, cladribine again um, uh, turned out to be uh, safe. And later on also uh, the concern about lemtrada decreased quite a bit. So at that time, uh, Ocrevus between all these uh, uh, let's say escalation treatment seem to be at least safer than the others because it affects mainly again the B cells. It doesn't affect B and T cells as for example, Lemtrada. Uh, now for the second case, why did I choose uh, Ocrevus? Um, uh, we, we may have choose another one, frankly, but after long discussion, the patient also felt uh, more towards uh, the Ocrevus than any of the other escalation treatments uh, after knowing especially the uh, uh, side effects of each of the uh, other medications. So she felt quite uh, comfortable with the Ocrevus more than the other uh, treatments. Okay. We have a question. Uh, aside from MS medication, what supplement is given to support the patients? Uh, in addition to MS, um, now, uh, now if we are uh, definitely uh, speaking during the, especially during the COVID outbreak, now uh, again, vitamin C, vitamin D, maybe zinc are uh, recommended. Now, if you are speaking outside the uh, outbreak, again, vitamin D, as we know, uh, is very important to, uh, uh, there, there, there are a lot of studies that showed that uh, people who have low vitamin D may be more predisposed to MS. So, so definitely checking vitamin D is important and giving it uh, as a supplement in uh, people uh, who have low, even, even uh, with minor doses in people uh, who have normal vitamin D, it could be a good uh, reason for that. In addition, uh, uh, we can use uh, just the normal antioxidants, uh, that uh, anybody can use, I mean, uh, but we emphasize that. Exercise also is important for MS patients. Uh, having a good sleep, uh, 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 trying to improve uh, uh, their immunity by getting their uh, the, uh, good uh, supplements, again, can be very important. Okay. Question is, what maximum age, or what is the maximum age that MS can start on them? Uh, what maximum age now? Uh, 
there are, uh, uh, as we know, usually MS is more a disease uh, in the uh, third and fourth decade of life. But again, as we know, there are uh, pediatric uh, MS that we can see even in the first decade and second decade. And there are cases of MS that we can see in the fifth decade. So usually, usually uh, still we can see it till age 45 or 47 or 48. After that, and after menopause, it's very unlikely. And if we see any case of MS, we need to investigate other uh, possibilities because it's very unheard of. OK. Uh, question, for how long do patients need to take uh, their treatment? And can they take a drug holiday uh, for their treatment? Now, definitely depending on what disease modifying treatment they are using, because as we know now, some of the newer uh, escalation treatments we can use only for a few years, such as Lemitrada, for example, we can use only for two years. Now, for Ocrevus, usually uh, uh, it is for 40, uh, it is for uh, I think 192 weeks, which are which we are speaking mainly about uh, about uh, four four and a half years. Uh, the usual treatment uh, it is used. Uh, again, um, uh, but for for most of the other treatments, we are to we are talking about uh, uh, long long uh, life treatment uh, uh, for uh, for life. I mean, basically, especially if we are talking about the platform treatments. And this question for Dr. Tofiq: What is the possible reason of MS in pediatric cases? I think he's muted. Okay. I think Dr. Tofi is muted. Uh, maybe. Oh, you can answer that if you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can. Again, what's what's the question? What is the possible reason for MS in pediatric patients? I mean, I mean, what what are the risk factors? Let's put it this way. Uh, risk factor, or wh uh, wh why do children get MS? Why do children now? Um, now, definitely uh, in pediatric cases, genetic predisposition can play a big role. Uh, sometimes, again, MS uh, supposed uh, some viruses can predispose the patient to uh, to MS. Most of the time, we don't know. Frankly, most of the time, we don't know. But there are definitely genetic and viral. Uh, predisposition to the disease. Okay. Uh, question, how do we manage patients who has MS and other comorbidities? Uh, you know, high blood pressure, seizure, uh, you know, chronic diseases. Exactly. Now, uh, now, most of the medication usually do not cause major problem in those general concerns. I mean, definitely sometimes we can see some increase in hypertension after uh, some disease modifying treatments, even including Ocrevus, but this is very rare. Uh, it was reported, but nobody knows if it is exactly due to the Ocrevus or it is just uh, by matter of time. Uh, now, um, uh, in general, we treat the other comorbidities like we treat them if we don't have MS. So, so basically, so ba basically, we need to treat the hypertension. We need to treat the uh, asthma. We need to treat the thyroid disease. Uh, some uh, disease modifying treatments, for example, Lemtrada, can cause in the third year uh, or after uh, thyroid disease. So, in this case, we need to deal with that uh, depending on uh, the scenario. I mean, basically. But again. Again, we can't treat them uh, like the patient without MS, basically. Okay. Uh, can you tell us why did you choose Ocrevus in this patient? Which patient? The first or the? First one. Ah, the first one. Uh, again, as I answered uh, this question, I used uh, Ocrevus uh, because there was an aggressive nature of the disease again. And at the same time, because of 
the clinical mild scenario in general, I didn't want to go into Lemtrada or going into Cladribine. And again, I always tend to discuss uh, pros and cons of each medication with the patient. So, um, so the, the patient had also a matter of uh, uh, preference for that medication, but, but mainly because there was an aggressive nature and at the same time, uh, the clinical scenario was not that, that high to go into uh, Lemtrada again or uh, Cladribine. Okay. Uh, one question from Dr. Talib saying, are you, are you doing MR spectroscopy, spectroscopy in some suspected cases of MS? Uh, I don't do it a lot. Definitely sometimes if we need to differentiate some of those tumefactive uh, MS lesions, if we need to make sure that we are not dealing with tumor, yes, we, we can go into that. We don't do it routinely, but if there are suspected uh, cases uh, and uh, the differential diagnosis is with uh, metastasis or tumor, yes, we do that. Okay. Uh, question whether uh, it is a, a male or female with MS, can they try for uh, to get uh, a baby with Ocrevus? With Ocrevus, all in general, all disease modifying treatment, uh, the preference are to be stopped uh, if the patient is intending to get pregnant. At least I'm speaking about the woman. Uh, the man, definitely, there is no problem. There were sometimes some concerns about uh, that some of the medication can be secreted with the semen, uh, but usually this is not a major concern. Uh, for women, definitely disease-modifying treatment should be stopped before pregnancy. Now, if the patient is highly aggressive patient and there is concern of relapses during the pregnancy, some of the uh, medication seem to be safer, such as the uh, beta interferons and the copazole. Seem to be safer than others. You know, if patients become pregnant while on treatment, mm -hmm. uh, what would you recommend? Definitely we recommend to stop the medication on treatment. And uh, uh, the, best, the best choice is always to tell the patient about uh, if there is any intention of getting pregnant and all that, because it's better definitely to, uh, to uh, have the precaution before the pregnancy, but if the pregnancy happened, yes, we stop the medication. Now, now again, if there, uh, again, if during the pregnancy, after stopping the medication, the patient had an attack, then we may consider, uh, in this case, uh, beta interferons, and sometimes we may also consider for the attack itself uh, the solumedrol and IVIG. Okay. Uh, another question, would you consider switching Ocrevus in signs of disease activity like MRI or relapses, or is it only considered when the patient progress on the EDSS scores? Ah, uh, do I consider switching to Ocrevus, you mean, uh, uh, only on a clinical basis or uh, if, uh, uh, if there is clinical basis or only if there is radiological? Uh, it's always better to correlate both of them. Now, if you are dealing with a, a clinically stable patient, no attacks, no progression, but we saw that there is only one uh, lesion, I may not consider to switch, no. Again, uh, if, if we are dealing again with even two lesions which are very small, uh, without any uh, change in a clinical scenario, frankly, I may not consider. But more than that, yes. Sometimes with increased radio radiological lesions, if you are speaking about two or more lesions that are uh, typical of uh, MS lesions and or they are enhancing and all that, uh, yeah, this is an indication that there is 
uh, progression going on and we need to uh, switch to another medication. Okay. Uh, you know, in treating MS patient, which outcome do you usually uh, go after? Is it uh, reduce the burden of the disease? Is it reducing the relapse? Is it decreasing the lesion? Which outcome do you put as a target in the therapy? Frankly, we should put all of them. Uh, definitely one is more important sometimes than the other, but definitely we need to put all uh, clinically. Uh, again, the clinical outcome is uh, most important. Uh, for example, the, uh, to avoid the progression and to avoid relapses. Uh, but again, we should also consider radiological as a second uh, target after that. Okay. Dr. Tofiq mentioned in his uh, first slides that many patients uh, do not have clinical symptoms, but they have inflammation for a long time before the clinical symptoms actually appear. Mm. So do you recommend the screening patient like people screen osteoporosis and other diseases uh, or rheumatoid arthritis? Do you think uh, MS, uh, the, is there enough MS that warrant uh, screening with MRI for anybody who cannot remember what he ate yesterday? <laughs> uh, definitely not, frankly, for, uh, for many reasons. First of all, even though multiple sclerosis is a very debilitating disease, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't reach the uh, percentage wise to go and screen all people uh, for that. Second of all, as we know, MRI is a costly, uh, uh, is a costly uh, uh, test and it is unwise to go and screen again with MRI uh, for that. So no, I don't recommend that. So what do you recommend? I mean, uh, if somebody have a family history, uh, I mean, when should patient actually go and consult before they get clinical symptoms? Okay, now if there is a high uh, uh, familial history, this can be uh, this is this can be one indication. Now uh, again, we may emphasize uh, that if the patient had uh, any symptoms, that they should not delay the investigation. But if they don't have symptoms and no uh, significant family history. Maybe we don't, because still even till now, um, there are some studies going on now that are speaking of possible following radiologically isolated uh, syndromes uh, to see the if, uh, if we treat them uh, with uh, like uh, Tecfidera and uh, Obagio, uh, that will help over the long run. Uh, but still, it's not approved yet. And I don't think still in hands, we don't have yet uh, the definite answer uh, to go and treat the radiologically isolated. So I don't think it, it warrants this kind of investigation. You know, what, you know, uh, is there any lab test sometime? I mean, a patient come and do blood tests for different uh, visits, not specifically neurology. Mm. From these lab tests uh, in the lab, would they, uh, any of the lab uh, trigger an indication to identify patients who might be at high risk of MS? Frankly, usually not, uh, usually not. I mean, definitely now if we are dealing with, uh, we saw, uh, for example, uh, increased, let's say, uh, ESR and CRP, there are multiple uh, diseases that we can think about before we consider MS, because anyway, MS is very rare also to, to cause any increase in the systemic uh, markers, uh, if we are speaking about. It's very rare, but if we ruled out everything else and maybe with some uh, symptoms, non-specific symptoms, we may consider that, but frankly, usually not. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in reimbursement wise by the insurance company, is there any uh, preference uh, for them to start on the platform therapy versus disease modifying therapy? Uh, from insurance point of view, uh, now uh, we need to uh, to give the uh, uh, right documentation about why we need this treatment. Because uh, definitely, from insurance companies, they they prefer always uh, to go with the platform therapy and with the cheapest. Let's put it this way: with the cheapest uh, medications. Uh, so that's why we need to provide them with. Uh, uh, right documentation and with the justification why we are uh, choosing this medication over another. Okay. I don't see any uh, other questions. So I would like uh, to thank you, Dr. Caesar and Dr. Tofiq, for very informative sessions and very excellent Q&A uh, time. And I'd like to thank Roche for sponsoring this uh, seminar and for bringing to our patient here in UAE a state of, of the art therapy for MS that helped them in resolving their symptoms and reducing the relapses and this difficult uh, MS disease. So we'll see you later, inshallah, in other seminars and have good night and thank you. and. Tomorrow, by email, you will get uh, the evaluation form to get your certificate for attending this seminar. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.